Well, welcome to Sunday School on the Go from the First Baptist Church in Tallahassee. I'm Jim Glass, one of the teachers in the Pairs and Spares class. And in our current quarter of Bible study on this third Sunday of May, it's my privilege to lead you through a brief overview of the Apostle Paul's two letters to the followers of Christ in Thessalonica. Today, in our second lesson from the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, Paul addresses two major concerns about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first is related to a rumor that Paul had sent them a letter saying that the day of the Lord had already come. And the second concerns the mysterious, diabolical man of lawlessness who will appear before the Lord's return. Since Jesus' coming is far nearer to our day than it was for the Thessalonians to whom Paul was writing, there is much in the first 12 verses of this second chapter that should alert us to be ever more prepared and watchful for the Lord's return. After this brief word of thanksgiving to God for the ever-growing faith, love, and hope of the Thessalonians that we saw in the first chapter, and his reminder of the judgment that will come to all unbelievers and the salvation that will come to every believer, Paul immediately launches into the main purpose of his letter in this second chapter. Here's what he says in the first two verses. Now, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Somehow, the faithful followers of Christ in Thessalonica had been told that the day of the Lord had already come, and, and the word supposedly came from Paul himself. Now, this is a group of Christians who first heard the gospel only a year to a year and a half ago, and had been taught by Paul for only three weeks before he had to leave. So we could well imagine that their faith was significantly challenged in light of this fake news, to say the least, when this word started to spread and the incredible confusion it must have caused. Paul wasn't there to answer their questions. He was most likely still in Corinth, and Timothy and Silas weren't there either. So to whom could they turn to find the truth? Could it have been that they misunderstood Paul's sense of urgency, thinking that the Lord would return within Paul's lifetime? Was there some outside influence or even a persuasive believer within the church itself who came to this conclusion? Unfortunately, we don't know the answer to any of these questions. We do know that 1 Thessalonians was written in response to Timothy's report to Paul about the situation there, but there's nothing in this second letter that tells us how Paul found out about this newest concern. What we do know is that Paul directly addresses their concerns by explaining that the world must run through a process of spiritual preparation identified by specific events before Christ will come again. Our Lord's first advent was in the fullness of time, so Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, and his second advent will occur in the fullness of time as well. And although Paul might not be able to interpret all the signs or tell when the great day would actually dawn, he could say to the Thessalonians, the end is not yet. The day of the Lord that Paul refers to here has been variously understood. While we typically think of it as the moment when Jesus returns, it also includes the judgment of the wicked during the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, a judgment that could possibly come before or after a three-and-a-half or a seven-year period of tribulation. Many believe that the Lord will call His church to heaven before, during, or after that period of tribulation in an event that is known as the rapture, although the actual word rapture isn't in the Bible, and the idea of a rapture didn't appear before the 1800s. So good and faithful Bible students have developed quite a wide variety of opinions on these and other events surrounding the day of the Lord. But a discussion of these ideas is far beyond the scope of our brief study here, so we'll have to leave that for another day. In regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and their gathering to Him, 
Paul has already told them a great deal, both when he was with them and in his first letter to them. In his first letter, he calmed their fears about believers who had died, assuring them that the living believers would meet those who had passed away with the Lord when he returns. He also encouraged them to remain alert and vigilant, pursuing sanctification since it was God's will for them and us, especially as they and we await the Lord's return. Then, in the final chapter of his first letter, he encouraged them not to despise prophesyings, but to test everything. In spite of all that, their ability to test everything through the gift of spiritual discernment was certainly limited by their young faith and contributing to their current confusion. So to calm their fears and address their concerns, he speaks about the two events he told them in his first letter would happen together. The Lord's return and their gathering together with him, as if to say, in all this confusion and any further misunderstandings that might occur, always remember that the Lord Jesus will return and you will be caught up with him. You won't be left behind, regardless of whether the Lord returns tomorrow or a thousand years from now, you will not be left behind, and you will be joined with your deceased brothers and sisters in Christ. One commentator notes the difficulty posed by Paul's words here when he writes, It is, however, difficult to conceive how the Thessalonians could think that the day of the Lord was actually present. We can't imagine that they thought that Christ had already come for judgment. It appears, however, best to suppose that the word is a strong expression for the imminence of that day, that the hour of the advent was about to strike. The Thessalonians ought always to be living in a state of pre preparation for the day of the Lord, as that day would suddenly come and come unexpectedly. But they were not to be so impressed with a sense of its immediateness as to be deprived of their sober reason. So to restore their sense of balance and perspective, Paul asks that they not be quickly shaken from their composure or become easily unsettled or alarmed. They knew, Paul had told them in his first letter, that the day of the Lord would come as a thief in the night as far as unbelievers were concerned. But they, the believers in Thessalonica, would be prepared for that day. Of that, they should not worry. But something had knocked them for a loop. Even in your own lifetime and mine, there have been those who claimed the day of the Lord is upon us, causing considerable confusion to believers as well as embarrassment to the church. So to counter this and equip believers then and now with a clear, divinely inspired two-part timeline of the days leading up to the day of the Lord, Paul tells them that there will first be a great falling away and second, the appearance of one he calls the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. Verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. First apostasy, second, the man of lawlessness. His initial warning is clear. Do not let anyone deceive you by any means. There were then, and there still are attempts to deceive believers and unbelievers into thinking a lie about the day of the Lord. In Paul's day, someone had even told them that the day of the Lord had come, as if his words came from Paul, or someone had written a letter and signed Paul's name to it. As fast as rumors rush upon us from social media and 24-hour news cycles today, we must protect ourselves even more diligently from deceptive messages about the day of the Lord. Two things have to happen. First, there will be a falling away, an apostasy, or as more modern translations read, the rebellion. What exactly this is, Paul doesn't tell us. As a result, opinions vary considerably about the specifics about this essential event. The word apostasy is our English pronunciation of the very word Paul used, and it means 
of falling away or defection from or abandoning one's faith. Most Bible teachers have taken this to mean that before the day of the Lord, a great many professing Christians will abandon their faith, some believing it will be the result of persecution that will precede the Lord's return, just as happened during the persecution of believers under the Roman emperors Nero and Trajan. They point to Jesus' words to his disciples in response to their questions about what would be the sign of his return in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus said, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Other Bible scholars see Paul speaking of a religious falling away, but a religious affection that doesn't involve Christians. Instead, they say that it involves the Jews who will reject the faith of their father Abraham. In reality, both of these have actually been occurring since soon after the church was established. Here again, a deeper discussion of this falling away, whether believers or Jews, we'll have to wait for another day. What Paul does speak about much more clearly is this mysterious man of lawlessness or man of sin, whom we, Paul refers to as the son of perdition, or again, as other translations read, the son of destruction, meaning the one destined for destruction. This person is the anti-Christ. He is everything Jesus is not. Jesus gave this name to Judas Iscariot, as we read in John chapter 17, verse 12. But there will be a far greater fulfillment of this name in the days to come. To give a full account of the various interpretations of the description given in these few verses is even farther beyond the scope of our brief time together than either the day of the Lord or the apostasy. So we'll stay focused on what Paul tells us in his own words as he speaks under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. First, he's called the son of destruction because the overwhelming nature of his sinfulness leads to only one outcome, destruction. What exactly has he done to deserve this? Paul tells us in verse 4 that he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. As the man of lawlessness, he epitomizes the rejection of moral restraint and the denunciation of any authority except his own. It's the consummation of the sinful mind that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, that is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Not only does this man of lawlessness seek to eliminate the worship of the one true God, his desire is to put an end to every form of religion, making himself the sole object of worship throughout the world. Now, the Old Testament prophet Daniel had a vision that he recorded for us in chapter 8 of the book that bears his name. In this vision, he saw four great beasts that came out of the sea, the first like a lion, the second like a bear, the third like a leopard, and the fourth so terrifying that he could offer no comparison. Gabriel was told to explain the dream to him. In his explanation, he said, In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will cause the astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, perhaps when the unbelievers are saying peace and safety, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Then in chapter 10, we read that Daniel had another dream 
that provided additional insight to the first dream he had back in chapter 8. In chapter 11, the interpreter of this dream of chapter 10 told him more about this last king in beginning of verse 36. This king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the God of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one des desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. So Paul carries Daniel's prophecy even farther in that not only will this man of lawless eliminate the worship of God, but he will substitute for it the worship of himself as he sets himself up as God. In reality, this kind of thing was happening even as Paul wrote. Luke tells us about a speech that King Herod made to the people of Caesarea recorded for us in Acts chapter 11. When Herod spoke, the people said, This is the voice of a God, not of a man. When Julius Caesar, who had already been honored with temples, statues, and altars during his life, died in 27 BC, his great nephew Augustus became the emperor and deified Julius, giving him all divine and human honors. Naturally, the, this also made Augustus divine as well. Although each emperor wielded his supposedly divine authority differently, Paul and the Thessalonians had a living example of what the man of lawlessness would be like, and the requirement to offer incense to the emperor as God was a crucial test for the faith of many Christians. But Paul doesn't point to the current events of his day to suggest that the day of the Lord is at hand. His point is that the final man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will embody everything that is wicked and blasphemous. This man of lawlessness is not a government, not a world system, not an idea, but is clearly a person who claims that he is God and does everything he can to make people believe it to be true. In the revelation that was given to him on the Isle of Patmos, the Apostle John adds much more to this description, but Paul is writing 40 years or so before John's dream. Since Paul wrote these words, there of course have been many whose names have been put forward as this man of lawlessness, from popes to presidents, despots to dictators, and at every age, there are those who give every indication that they could be this man of lawlessness. We will do well to remember what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. But the man of lawlessness of 2 Thessalonians has not yet been revealed. So having addressed their concern about the details concerning the Lord's return, Paul abruptly stops to ask in verse 5, Don't you remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? They shouldn't have been misled by these reports, especially those that supposedly came from him, because he had told them so much about the Lord's return and how it would come about, the apostasy, the man of lawlessness, and many other things as well. What he had told them then was still true, and he didn't feel the need to explain everything all over again. But just in case they had misunderstood something of the timing of the day of the Lord, he's provided this gentle reminder that God had a carefully timed and orchestrated plan for the inauguration of the day of the Lord that allowed for the man of lawlessness and all those who would follow him either to repent or to fill up the full measure of their judgment. One commentator reminds us that this is the ethical law which underlies the apostles' prophecy. It's a law confirmed by the teaching of Jesus himself and illustrated by the whole course of history. The question is sometimes discussed whether the world gets better 
or worse as it grows older. And optimists and pessimists take opposite sides upon it. Both, this law informs us, are wrong. It does not get better only, nor worse only, but both. Its progress is not simply a progress in good, evil being gradually driven from the field, nor is it simply a progress in evil before which good continually disappears. It's a progress in which good and evil alike come to maturity, bearing their ripest fruit, showing all that they can do, proving their strength to the utmost against each other. The progress is not in good in itself, nor in evil in itself, but in the antagonism of the one to the other. This is the same truth which we are taught, he says, by the parable of our Lord, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reaper, gather up first the tares. In the time of the harvest, not till all is ripe for judgment, not till the wheat and the tares alike have shown all that is in them, will the judgment come. This is what St. Paul understood and what the Thessalonians did not understand. And if his ignorance of the scale of the world and the scale of God's purposes made him apply this law to the riddle of history hastily, with a result which the event has not justified, that's nothing to the prejudice of the law itself, the law of the wheat and the tares, which was true when he applied it with his imperfect knowledge and is true for application still. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather up first the tares and then the wheat. This is exactly what Paul tells us in the remaining verses of our focal text for today. First, in verse 6, we learn that the man of lawlessness is currently being restrained. Paul says, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. The Lord Jesus will not return until first, there is a falling away, and second, the man of lawlessness is revealed. Before the man of lawlessness is revealed, he must be permitted to reveal himself. What exactly who or what it was that is currently restraining him? Paul and the Thessalonians knew, and that's most likely the reason he doesn't go into more detail here. The only problem is we don't know. For the first 1,800 years or so of the church, scholars said that this restraining force is the fabric of civil society built upon the law, the law of God, or what others call the natural law, the law that we all know in our hearts to follow. From what Paul says in Romans chapter 13, we know that he had a profound respect for the law of the land because it was God who placed leaders in places of responsibility and power to rule according to his good purposes. Therefore, we ought to obey those in authority over us because, verse 4, Romans chapter 13, he is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also, he says, because of conscience. Disobedience became extremely difficult for believers when the laws of the empire were set aside by the personal desires of the emperor. In the last 150 years or so, scholars have focused more on the likelihood that the Holy Spirit is the one who's holding back this man of lawlessness until the time for his revealing comes. Since the likelihood that the man of lawlessness has and will increasingly use government forces and even the majority will of the people, many people believe it's the Holy Spirit who's keeping this man of lawlessness in check. In the meantime, Satan is very much at work in the world. Paul tells us that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. 
In the New Testament, a mystery is something that was previously unknown or shrouded in secrecy before it was revealed and understood. In this case, what was previously unknown about the role of evil, personified in the man of lawlessness, has been revealed. The principle of sin that became a reality in the Garden of Eden and has persisted ever since and will one day culminate in the embodiment of evil who will suddenly appear on the world, on the world stage. Until then, a stream of anti-Christian activity and behavior and thought will continue to ebb and flow throughout history. As a result, no one can point to a person today and say with certainty, this is the Antichrist, because the source of all evil in the world is still hidden. But once the restraining influence has been removed, every doubt will disappear. Once the Holy Spirit steps aside and allows the man of lawlessness to fulfill his destiny, his doom has already been decided. Verse 8, Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. No longer will the man of lawlessness be working secretly, but openly, and in a way that is no longer a mystery to, to those whom he had deceived. And then, how is his destruction accomplished? The Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth. So overwhelming and irresistible is the power of the Lord Jesus that when the time has been fulfilled for the defeat of the man of lawlessness, a mere puff of his breath will be sufficient to destroy him. In the Revelation, chapters 1 and, chapter, uh, chapters 1 and 19, John describes the Lord as bearing a sword that came out of his mouth. In Isaiah's prophecy about the Messiah, he tells us in chapter 11, verse 4, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And his final destruction will occur by the appearance of the Lord's coming, or the splendor of his coming. Now, the word appearance or splendor is the word from which we get our word epiphany, meaning an appearing or appearance, but always referring to the appearance of the Lord when he will come to judge the world. There's no real idea of splendor within the word itself, but the appearance of the Lord will certainly be accompanied by the radiance and splendor of his glory and majesty. And the pure brilliance of his presence alone will be sufficient to destroy every form and vestige of evil, darkness, and lawlessness. In verses 9 and 10, Paul provides a few more details about the work of this man of lawlessness, saying he is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Paul makes it clear that Satan is the power behind the man of lawlessness, whom he uses for his own purposes, and, as you would expect, using the same means Satan has always used to accomplish his objectives. Those means, Paul says, include power and signs and false wonders with all the deception of wickedness. Now, Peter told the people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, signs, and wonders, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Now, this agent of Satan will use what will appear to be this same triad of extraordinary demonstrations of natural and supernatural power, miracles, wonders, and signs, to convince people that he is the one who ought to be worshipped, even as our Lord foretold in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, when he said, false Christs and prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect. Of the three terms used to name these demonstrations of power, signs is the word most frequently found in Scripture. Signs are those things that point to the source of the power that's shown in a particular display. In John's Gospel, he tells us about seven 
distinct signs that pointed to the fact that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. Wonder is closest to what we think of when we use the word miracle and focuses on the outward effect of these demonstrations of power, the astonishment or fear or awe they produce, for example. The word power directs our attention to the strength or energy behind the event. The man of lawlessness will use all three of these, miracles, wonders, and signs, but they will all be lies, deceptions, tricks, illusions, and frauds that attempt to fool people into thinking he indeed is an all-powerful being who deserves to be worshipped as God. Not only will this agent of Satan put on a show of miracles, wonders, and signs that serve the lie, he puts forth these things as if they were the truth. The energy that drives the man of lawlessness, the energy that comes from Satan himself, includes all the deception of wickedness. On one of those occasions when the Pharisees challenged Jesus' authority, recorded for us in John chapter 8, he told them that they didn't believe him because they were children of their father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, Jesus said, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. As Satan will use the beasts that we read about in chapter 13 of the Revelation, John tells us one of the beasts performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. So John writes, Why will those who believe this lie be destroyed? Paul says that it's because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Everything the man of lawlessness says and does will only contribute to their eventual destruction, even though these things might appear to them to be good. Good for them, good for society, good for everyone. It's all a lie. And they buy into it because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. When we place our trust, our, our trust and our hope in Jesus, receiving Him as our Savior and allowing Him to be the unchallenged Lord of our lives, not only are we saved from eternal separation from God and all those things that we learned about last week from chapter 1, we're also protected from these lies and deceptions that we read about here. We have the ability, as Paul told the Thessalonians in his first letter, chapter 5 and verse 21, to test everything, hold on to the good, and avoid every kind of evil. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we can test everything to see if it truly comes from God. John wrote to his friends these precious words in his first letter, chapter 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is a spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Those who have refused to love the truth don't have the ability to discern truth. They can't distinguish between good and evil. And even if they could, they can't choose what is good and true because as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. The mind of the sinful man is death. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. 
And it's all because they did not receive the love of the truth. If they had, they would have been saved from all this. Their hearts had no desire to receive the truth. There was no longing within them that compelled them to come to the cross, confess their sin, and give their lives to Christ. They couldn't handle the truth because it would have made them have to deal with their own sin against a righteous and holy God and admit that they were sinners. They might agree that there is a God who created heaven and earth, a God to whom each of us will one day give an account of how we lived, just like the demons James wrote about who believe that there is one God. But they saw no need to love the truth about God, to embrace it as their own. If they did, they would have been saved. As it is, they have no desire to be saved from their sins, that the truth lays bare in their lives. The result of not receiving the love of the truth is not only to reject the hope of the gospel, but to be left with believing Satan's lies, spread by his false signs, deceptive wonders, and pretended powers. And they will not be able to not believe his lies. The unbelievers who are even now perishing, even now experiencing the consequences of their refusal to know God and obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus, perish. Not only because they refuse to receive the love of the truth, but also, verse 11, because of their unending pursuit of that which is false. For this reason, Paul says, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. They won't receive the love of the truth, but they will readily believe what is false. Just as God hardened Pharaoh's heart after the Pharaoh had hardened his own heart against the Israelites, God will send them a strong delusion that will only reinforce the strength of the lie they've already embraced. As part of God's judgment, unbelievers will only believe more and more the lies that will come from the man of lawlessness. Now, it's important to note here that believers are protected from this deluding influence because we have received the love of the truth. We've embraced the truth about ourselves, about sin, about forgiveness, about God, and about our time with Him in eternity. In our Lord's last instructions to His disciples, where He told them about His return, He said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, that false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. It's not possible for those whom God has chosen to be His adopted children to fall victim to the lies and deceit of the man of lawlessness, as long as they do not allow themselves to be deceived verse 3 of this chapter in 2 Thessalonians. Stand firm in what they've been taught, verse 15, and allow the Lord Jesus to strengthen their hearts in every good work and word, verse 16. What then is the final result of their refusal to receive the love of the truth, verse 10, that leads to their unending pursuit of that which is false, verse 11? Paul tells us in verse 12, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Those who refuse to re receive the love of the truth are left with only one other option, believing a lie and experiencing all the consequences of that false belief, including taking pleasure in wickedness. Just as Jesus came for judgment, as He told the Pharisees who questioned Him about the man born blind whom He had healed, separating out those who realize their blindness from those who claim they can see, so also the man of lawlessness will reveal those who have received the love of the truth and those who have not. He will attract those like him, those who have rejected the truth and who show their hatred of the truth, and they will welcome him with open arms. As, as Paul told the believers in Rome, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And, chapter 1, verse 28, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them, gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. 
and that lie works with increasing power in their souls until they reject every possibility that what they believed in really and truly is a lie. Sin bears its punishment in itself. And when sin reaches its full measure, it's clear that it's been executing a judgment of God more awful than anything we could conceive. The alternative, though, is so, so much better. Receive the love of the truth. Embrace the truth of the gospel. And the blood of Christ cleanses us from every sin. One commentator closes his remarks with this. This is the final lesson of the passage. We do not know all the forces that are work, at work in the world in the interest of error, but we know that there are many. We know that the mystery of iniquity is already in operation. We know that falsehood in the spiritual sense has much in us which is its natural ally and that we need to be steadily on our guard against the wiles of the devil. We know that passion is uncertain, the reason is often weak, and that we see our true selves in the action of heart and conscience. Be faithful, therefore, to God at the core of your nature. Love the truth that you may be saved. This alone is salvation. This alone is a safeguard against all the delusions of Satan. It was the one who knew God, who did always the work of God, who loved God as the only begotten Son of the Father. Who could say, the Prince of the world is coming and he has nothing in me. Well, thank you for being a part of our brief survey of Paul's second letter to these amazing disciples of Christ in Thessalonica whose lives radiated with faith, love, and hope as they lived in eager anticipation of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are certainly many questions we didn't answer today, but the Lord will make it clear in His way and His time. So as the day of the Lord approaches, don't be disturbed by fake news about the Lord's return. Instead, remember God's plan and embrace the love of His truth as you reach out to the lost world around you. Next week, in the remaining verses of this chapter and the first five verses of chapter 3, we'll hear Paul's prayer for the believers there along with his request that they would pray for him. As always, as it's still a good thing to do, keep calm, trust in the Lord, and wash your hands. God bless you.